Did you know that you can watch many of your favorite GLC programs all in one place for free? Just go online at www.glc.us.com and click on the GLC Teachers tab at the top of the homepage. From there you can scroll through dozens of quality GLC video archives containing over 100 full-length programs, updated weekly, and covering topics from Bible teachings and current events to scriptural, financial, and personal health. We've got it all covered at www.glc.us.com, so don't delay, start watching for free today. is good. Tamu aru ki tov Adonai, ashrei hagever yachasebo. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who trusts in Him. Let me welcome you to our program today, Hebrew Heritage Bible Search. I'm Brad Young, and my precious wife, Gail, is with us today as we explore the Hebrew heritage of our faith. Hi, glad to be here today, thanks. Gail's job is to grill me with some questions and to bring some fresh life from, uh, so often questions that have come into our ministry or questions that others have asked about some of these teachings. As you know, many of our faithful viewers who have been following along in this program, we have been exploring the Hebrew heritage of our faith by searching the deeper meaning of the Bible. I don't know about you, but I know that many times as I study the scriptures, I feel like there's something deeper, there's something more there. And we've found that through looking at Hebrew, looking at the Jewish background of Jesus' teachings, exploring the heritage of the Jewish people, that we can really understand Jesus better. I think I really, you know, got into this when I went to Israel for the first time in 1972. And since then, I've been going back to Israel. I lived in Israel, and I found that it has greatly enriched my own faith to study uh, the Bible and the land of the Bible with the people of the Bible and Israel is one of the great classrooms of the Bible. I think one of the things that really challenged me as well was the fact that uh, growing up in a very evangelical church, I had kind of felt that you know, there wasn't very much value really in the Old Testament or Judaism. And I'm not going to say that that's the way it is in all evangelical churches. And, you know, every church is different. Every pastor is different. But I would say in my own upbringing, there was not a greater sensitivity to those roots, that foundation. And I think when I started studying Hebrew, I began to see Jesus in a different light. And really, just to look at this prayer that Jesus taught us. It's not really the Lord's Prayer like we call it because it's not the prayer that he prayed for himself. It's really the disciples' prayer. And if you're a disciple of Jesus and you want to follow his example, he gave you a prayer which can be a pattern, an example to prayer. Each one of these seven petitions, seven prayers can be kind of an outline of prayer. After our Father who art in heaven, you can think about all the passages of the scripture that deal with the nature, the character of God. Some of the ones we've talked about. Hanun Barachum, how merciful God is, how uh, he's filled with loving kindness. Or some of the prayers that we've learned from the old synagogue, the temple, the prayers that Jewish people pray during the time of Jesus give us a lot of insight into the original substance, meaning, and content to the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Above all, we must learn to pray through practice. And we need to do more than just learn about prayer. We need to look in the deepest recesses of our heart to have a true outpouring 
of our, what we really need before the Lord. And today, as we come to this petition, give us this day our daily bread, we look at a text where Jesus is teaching us to pray about our needs. Now, prayer is more than praying for our needs. Prayer is worship. Prayer is exaltation. Prayer is a song. Prayer is a life that we live for God by obeying the commandments, doing His will. The prayer is lifting up our needs and our petitions. And this is a direct command from the life and teachings of Jesus. Well, today I want us to focus on this by going back to the Hebrew roots, the Old Testament background into the Bible. And we're going to read a passage here from Proverbs chapter 30, beginning in verse 5. I really believe that in some ways Jesus is referring to Proverbs 30. And we haven't always been sensitive to that. We haven't always seen that. Part of the problem is our translation. I think if we could hear Jesus teach in Hebrew, and if we could read the Bible in Hebrew, we would see the interconnectedness between these passages. Because a lot of times Jesus teaches as if he's giving a hint or an allusion back to a whole network of Bible passages that flew, that were flowing through the minds of ancient Jewish leaders. Let's uh, read together this passage in Proverbs 30, beginning in verse 5. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version, which I think is one of the better, more literal translations for serious Bible studies. But even the best translations we need to look at in light of the Hebrew and the Greek text. Uh, here uh, he says, Every word of God is tested. I know I've got another uh, Jewish translation, the uh, Jewish um, Theological Society, JPS Publication Society. I like the way they translated this. They said, every word of God is pure. Every word of God is pure. Every word is going to be true. And here they brought out the idea of testing the word of God. You can trust, you can depend on it. It is pure, it is holy, it is true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words or he will repuve, reprove you and you will be proved a liar. Two things I ask of you. And when he says two things have I ask of you, what is he really saying? He's saying here is a prayer to God. Uh, do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion. Now in Hebrew, this is hatrifeni et lechem chuki. Give me my daily bread. The word actually is bread. And it's used in the singular. I would point out that if we really looked at this in the Greek and we would compare uh, with the Hebrew background, really this prayer is very similar to Jesus' prayer. The only difference really is that Jesus is saying, give us our bread, using the plural of the first person. And there's something here about the prayer of Jesus that it's not just an individual disciple, me and Jesus have a good thing going. It's really that you pray this corporately as a body, as a group of disciples. And uh, it's very good to pray for yourself and pray by yourself. And we need to spend time alone praying with God by ourselves. But there is even a higher level when we pray as a community and we pray with one another. Here, the author of this proverb says, Don't give me excessive wealth. Don't remove from me all type of falsehood, deception. Give me what I need for today. I don't know, sometimes when we talk about uh, prosperity, it's almost like people want to take that verse from Galatians and translate it, but my God shall supply all your greed according to his riches and glory. Really, if we look at this, he is saying, my God shall supply 
all of your need. And there is a way that you pray for your needs. As we have compared the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray with some of the prayers that were prayed in the temple, it's very interesting to see that some of these petitions deal with your personal needs. And we have actually, in this series of programs, explored five of the petitions of the 18 that were prayed in the temple in Jesus' day. I believe strongly that Jesus prayed some form of these petitions. Now, we may have some changes in the liturgy, some changes in the word as time develops, but if we want to know the basic content, the basic thrust of prayer, we can learn a lot from the Jewish prayer book. Now, the sixth petition in the Jewish prayer book is a prayer for forgiveness. It says, Forgive us, O our Father, for we have sinned. Pardon us, O our King. There is the kingdom of God. For we have transgressed. For you do pardon and forgive. Blessed are you, O Lord, who is gracious and forgives a multitude of wrongs. Every one of us needs to recognize that we have done wrong. We are separated from the Holy God by our sins and our wrongdoing. And in the prayers that were prayed in ancient Israel, there was a calling out, a prayer for forgiveness. I love John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. There's a time for each and every one of us to pray and seek forgiveness, to receive Jesus Christ into our hearts and to make Him Lord. Now, as we look at prayers from ancient Israel and we begin to study prayers of the New Testament, we can see this interconnectedness, an acknowledgement of sin, a need for forgiveness. Even in First John, an epistle that's written in the New Testament, we have the admonition, Confess your sin before the Lord, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And there is a great value that's placed on confession of what you've done wrong. I think today it's kind of interesting because of changes that have happened in our society. There was one time where we would see if you had done something wrong, we'd say this was a terrible, immoral act. But today we talk more about choices, and it's not like there's right or wrong, but maybe you made a bad choice or you made a good choice. You're not a moral person or immoral person. It's almost like we're in an amoral age where there's no absolutes and nothing is right or wrong. Somebody told me the other day, well, we cannot know any truth. I said, well, is that an absolute? And they said, absolutely. So I guess they're proving that there are no absolutes by making an absolute. But when we study the scripture and we study the heritage of our faith, ancient Israel, revelation that came through the word of God was considered to be the foundation, the absolute. God spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. We can rely on his testimony. The word is trustworthy. The word of God will endure forever. Now, look at this uh, next request, because when we move into request number seven in these 18 benedictions that were prayed in the ancient temple, we actually move into requests that deal with personal needs. And uh, request number seven is a prayer that you would be given freedom from affliction. I think today there are many people that are afflicted, many people that have different types of addictions, uh, areas of their lives that need help. Uh, Here's the prayer. Look upon our affliction and fight for our cause. Redeem us speedily for your name's sake because you are a mighty redeemer. Blessed are you, O Lord, the Redeemer of Israel. Baruch Adonai HaGoel Yisrael. Here is the one 
who redeems Israel. And here is his heartfelt cry for deliverance from affliction. You know, I really believe if we would study the Hebrew heritage of our faith, we would recognize that sometimes even a cry of pain, a cry of suffering can be a prayer. We look in the story of the Exodus when the people of Israel were subjected to cruel slavery. Their cry of their affliction was heard as a prayer to God. And sometimes uh, in the darkest times of our lives, it's hard for us to pray or even articulate the words. But even in times like that, our prayer can be a prayer in a time of our affliction. Now, the eighth request from these prayers that deals with personal needs is a prayer for healing. I don't know the day when we talk to many who speak of God working miracles today, miracles of healing. They would never imagine that in the synagogue, that in the legalistic Jewish system, there would be prayers for divine healing. But actually, here we have a prayer, part of the 18 benedictions, this Amidah standing prayer. This is called the prayer in Judaism that stresses prayer for divine healing. And you are encouraged to pray for healing. Heal us, O Lord, and we shall be healed. Save us, and we shall be saved. You are our praise. Provide a perfect healing for all our wounds. Because you, Almighty King, there is the kingdom of God again. You are a faithful and merciful physician. Blessed are you, O Lord, who heals the sick of your people Israel. Now, here we have a very powerful prayer from Jewish liturgy that seeks healing for the physical body. Salvation, really, for the totality of human experience. It acknowledges that God is king and looks for him to heal the sick of Israel. Uh, We find in the book of Exodus that God sent his word and he healed them. And there is a promise of healing that flows here from these ancient Jewish prayers. I'd like to point out that the idea of healing in Hebrew was not so much that you could just heal one part. Like you're going to heal the body or you're going to heal the soul or there's spiritual healing. I mean, really, the Jewish worldview was that they saw the person as an entity, spirit, mind, and body. And healing was designed to impact every aspect of the person's experience. Now, the ninth request, which is the last one we'll deal with today, deals with financial blessing. And there is a prayer in the 19 benedictions, the 18 benedictions, the Amidah, that deal with financial blessing. Bless this year for us, O Lord, our God, together with every kind of produce there is. For from it, our well-being is provided for. Provide a blessing upon the face of the earth. Satisfy us with your goodness and bless our year like other good years. Blessed are you, O Lord, who blesses the years. When we pray for God to give us our daily bread. We are praying by way of extension for all of our needs, spiritual healing, physical healing, financial prosperity, that our needs would be met. Well, I'm going to stop here and go to Gail, who's been listening, and see if she has some questions that have come in for us. Well, I do have a question. Uh, The first one is, was Jesus a Pharisee? Jesus, I do not believe, was a Pharisee. I almost have to qualify that because the essential quality that we find about the Pharisees is that they believed in an oral tradition. And they believed that not only did God give us a written Torah, But he gave us at the same time an oral Torah, an oral law that would explain and apply the written Torah. 
And Jesus seems to make reference to this. He says, The scribes and Pharisees have sat on Moses' seat. Do what they say. Well, he did criticize the hypocrisy of some of the Pharisees, but it is a very powerful statement of affirmation when he says, Do what the scribes and Pharisees teach. Uh, this would indicate that if they're sitting on Moses' feet, seat and they are teaching, that their teachings are right and can be applied to our lives. I think when Christians today study rabbinic literature, study the Talmud, the Midrash, study Jewish prayer from the prayer book, this is very much in line of, uh, with what Jesus' the early disciples learned and studied. And even if some of the Talmudic literature, much of it is written in a later period, uh, it reflects earlier traditions and gives us a method of study. And what can we learn about Jesus from Jews? Uh, that question one time was asked me. I know this comes into our ministry by someone that really almost offended me. I was uh, studying at Hebrew University, working on my doctorate and my uh, professor, David Flusser, was an Orthodox Jew. And I had a Christian friend from America ask me, what can you, as a Christian, learn from a Jew about Jesus? And he thought that was a really pertinent question. And I've got to say, if Jesus is Jewish and he never changed his religion, we have much that we can learn from Jewish people about their faith, about the Bible, and even about the life and teachings of Jesus. Um, it's kind of interesting, and my experience was very positive at the Hebrew University, but it's interesting today that many Jewish scholars, Jewish leaders are saying, well, Jesus came from among our people. We need to reclaim Jesus. We need to learn what he has to teach us about his approach to Judaism, whether we accept what he taught or not. Today in the church, I think there is a great awakening. And people are talking about this. How can we separate Jesus from his family? How can we take him out of the synagogue? How can we separate him from the temple worship? We can't say that the church has replaced Israel. We have to say that God is working in the church and in Israel. We have to say that we can learn about Jesus from the Jewish people. So in light of that, was uh, we understand that Paul was uh, fairly well educated, and we listened to how Jesus teaches, so who was better educated, Jesus or Paul? Who was better educated, Jesus or Paul? Jesus! Yeshua! Uh, this, in some ways, should be surprising that it's so controversial. But I actually wrote this in my book, Jesus the Jewish Theologian, that Jesus was better educated than Paul. Uh, one of the editors, and there's different people that had it read the book, and not pointing any fingers at anybody specifically, but... They wrote with red ink all over the manuscript, exclamation marks. How can this be? Paul studied at the feet of Gamaliel. He was brought up in the Stoic schools of philosophy at Tarsus, this center of uh, Greek learning. But I think if you would really look at the teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, or you would look at the content, for instance, of the parables. I did, I've done a lot of work writing books, study of the parables of Jesus. I see over and over again the high academic achievement that Jesus had, both in the sophistication that he uses in his interpretation of Scripture and also in the way that he gives a practical application and challenges people with the decision in the method of learning that he gives. Uh, when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. You see how that he can take Torah teachings, 
give fresh life into them and give application to them. I want to say that Paul was not knowledgeable. He was very knowledgeable. But Jesus far exceeded Paul in his learning. Some people say, well, doesn't it say in the Gospel of John that Jesus was a Galilean and was unlearned? Actually, I think this is far overstated. I think what we see, if we really look at that in the context of the Gospel of John, is that the temple leaders from Judea tended to look down on people from Galilee. But as one of my teachers, Shmuel Safra'i, pointed out and has been demonstrated a number of recent important uh, academic works, uh, academic education was highly prized in Galilee, and there were synagogues, houses of study, and people achieved a high academic education in Galilee, even though the people you know, might argue back and forth who went to the best university. They both knew that Jesus was very well educated. Did, uh, would, would, he, would we consider Jesus to be observant? Did he do... Um do weekly rituals and did he do feasts and all that kind of stuff? Did he do all that stuff? Jesus was a Jewish Jew. Now, some people will say, I know Jesus was a Jew, but he was really a Baptist Jew or a Pentecostal Jew or a Catholic Jew or, you know, we tend to want to make him into a Christian. But if we look at the life and teachings of Jesus, and for me, this is very significant, something very important, of tremendous value and supreme significance. Jesus entered fully into the life of his people. He lived his life as a loyal Jew. He observed Torah. I cannot really find any place that Jesus ever violated Jewish law or halakha. He observed the Torah. He lived his life as a Jew. Um, this becomes pretty significant, I think, when we ask questions like the Sabbath. Some people say Jesus broke the Sabbath to prove that he was the Messiah. Ever think about how many Messiahs there would be if every Jewish person that ever transgressed any way the Sabbath law was a Messiah? That wouldn't prove anything. I think if we really look at what Jesus was saying is, I'm interpreting the Torah in the right way. So let me come back to what we've been saying, is that if you're going to interpret the Torah in the right way, and you're going to really understand prayer in the time of Jesus, there's a Hebrew foundation. There's a biblical understanding. And you really have to have that Hebrew understanding to appreciate Jesus' message. Thank you so much for joining us today on Hebrew Bible Search. We hope that you're enjoying our YouTube series, GLC Essentials. GLC Essentials takes you back to some of the very first programs from our most beloved teachers in their original folding formats. Available at no cost. Feel free to visit our website at glc.us.com where you can watch free new shows from our entire program lineup. You can also watch GLC 24 hours a day through our live stream located on the homepage. Be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel and, as always, please thumbs up this video. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus through the information on your screen. Thank you and God bless.